and basically my point is tonight, as it always is, uh, so please remember that you can go over to the website, you can go over to the mobile app, and from there you can get a copy of tonight's teachings. Uh, tonight's teachings are available on the website, on the mobile app, the outline for our teaching. So just head on over there to get a copy so that you can follow along with us. We are continuing our topical study of prayer. And we're calling this prayer ineffective prayer versus effective prayer because uh, what we've learned in this teaching is that uh, there is a such thing as targeted prayer. And there is a such thing as missing the target with our prayer. And we want to learn how to pray uh, where we, effectively so that we hit the target. And so the scriptures that we're using for the foundation of this teaching, uh, they come from Matthew, the seventh chapter, uh, verses seven and eight. And then the second scripture that we use for foundational purposes comes from James, the fifth chapter, verse 16, the latter portion of verse 16. So now what I want to see if I could do now, what I want to try to do now is head on over to uh, see if I can share this screen again. All right. So uh, we have our outline that we're following, ineffective prayer versus effective prayer. And again, that uh, foundation scripture, which comes from the gospel according to St. Matthew, reads as follows. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. What I want us to get from this, I don't want us to, to miss this. I want us to, you know, uh, take this to heart that Jesus is talking to you. If you are a believer, if you are born again, if you've got, uh, if you're saved, if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, as your personal savior, he is speaking specifically to you. He says, if you ask, it will be given to you. And you can just insert your name right there. If I ask, it will be given to me. If I seek, Jesus says, I will find. And he says, uh, when I knock, it will be open to me. We make these, when we study the word of God, we want to make it personal. You want to embrace the word of God and recognize that this is a personal love letter from God to you. He says, for everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds it to him who knocks, it will be open. And in this script, you know, you know he, he says everyone. And everyone includes me. Now, you know, when I look back over my history, when I look back over my pattern, I do know and recognize that there are times that I've asked and did not, it wasn't given to me. And there are times that I sought and, it, and I did not find. And there are times that I knocked and it was not open to me. And what the devil tries to do when that occurs is he tries to speak to your mind to tell you, you know, that's because God doesn't mean that for you. That's because that scripture doesn't work today. See, the, the objective of the enemy is to steal that word so that it is not planted in your heart. Because if that word doesn't get planted in your heart, it can't bear fruit for you. But if it gets planted in, in your heart, then it can bear fruit for you. So we've got the Bible says we can't be ignorant of Satan's devices. We have to recognize him. His objective is to steal the promises from us. So then what it requires me to do when I, uh, um, um, you know, take a look at passages of Scripture such as this, and I realize that there are times that I've asked and not, it's not been given to me, and there are times that I've stopped and haven't found, and there are times that I've knocked and it wasn't open to me. Instead of listening to the devil's lies, which would tell me that God is not doing it or that God's word isn't working or that it's not meant for us today, or that God, you know, is a liar. Because basically all of that suggests that God is a liar. And instead of believing the lie from the devil that God is a liar. Because remember, the devil is the one who's the liar. And he's the father of all lies. And anything that he whispers in your ear that contradicts the word of God, you've got to recognize it's a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. And you, you've got to refuse to receive it. So anyway, um, um, instead of embracing the enemy's lies, what we do. As believers, what what we do is embrace the promise of God and recognize that God's word is true. So then I've got to look at me and maybe there's something that I'm not doing right. Maybe there's something that I've missed because, you know, as we walk, you know, what we've been learning and teaching in this ministry and what we've been seeing as we've been analyzing the word of God is that the, the promises of God 
are, are conditioned. They're conditioned on some things that I've got to do. There are things that God requires of me. And I've got to meet those conditions in order for those promises uh, to be effectual in my life. And so what we've done with this passage of scripture is we went over and we looked and dug deeper into uh, what's meant by ask, what he's talking about with ask, and what he's talking about with seek, and what he's talking about with knock, and, and how that works. And we've gone into the actual Greek. We've looked at the Greek words that are translated in our English Bibles, ask, seek, and knock. And I'm going to get there in just a moment. But before I do, let me look at our second passage of Scripture that we're using as a foundation for this, this teaching. And that comes from the fifth chapter of uh, the epistle of James. And verse 16, the latter portion that reads, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. All right, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, we just looked at the scripture that said, ask and it will be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it will be opened to you. Jesus said, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks find all of those who knock the doors open to them. There's nobody left out of them if we do what he says and commands and instructs us to do. And over here in James, you know, this is further confirmed that God intends to, to, to do exactly what he said. And he means what he says in his word by indicating that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And when I see this word effective and I see that it's an adjective which, which uh, modifies the noun prayer. When I look at this word fervent, and I see that it is an adjective that modifies the word prayer, then what that tells me is that in order for this scripture to work, in order for prayer to avail much for me, it's got to be effective prayer. In order for prayer to avail much for me, it's got to be fervent prayer. And, and my mind works in such a way that when I see a word such as effective, if there's a such thing as effective prayer that avails much, then what that also tells me is that there is a such thing as ineffective prayer that does not avail much. If there's a such thing as fervent prayer that avails much, then there is, and the word fervent means passionate, the word fervent means fiery, then there is a such thing as cold prayer or non-passionate prayer that does not avail much. The condition here in this passage of Scripture is that the person has to be a righteous person. The, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person, a righteous man, a righteous woman avails much. So if I'm not walking in righteousness, if I'm disobedient to the Word of God, if I'm committing every sin I'm big enough to do and talking about I'll get grace from God to do it, then this Scripture won't work for me. Because I've got a God has saved me, God has redeemed me, God has traded places with me, He's imputed righteousness upon me, so now I need to act like I'm righteous. Okay, I can't walk around here and talk about God has declared me righteous and made me righteous, and I'm still acting unholy and unrighteous. Something's wrong with that. So I've got to, I've got to uh, uh, walk out what it is that He declares about me. Since he has made me righteous, I need to act that way. I need to act righteous. But now, so that's the condition of that passage of Scripture, that it's got to be a righteous man. But then the prayer itself has to be fervent. It needs to be a passionate prayer. The prayer itself needs to be effective. All right, effective, which means that we don't want it to be non-effective or ineffective. Because then uh, if it's ineffective, obviously it won't avail much. But now I want to go back over to uh, that other foundation scripture that we're using, which is found again over in Matthew, that seventh chapter. And I've highlighted, if you look at the visual that I have here on the screen for us, I've highlighted the words ask and seek and knock. And, you know, I've highlighted those because I want to go into you know, if, if we're going to uh, be real and recognize that God's word is true, and so when something is not working for me, you know, I need to dig deeper and make sure that I'm doing everything that God requires of me, what we need to do is make sure, in this case, that we have an accurate understanding of what he means by ask. We need to have an accurate understanding of what he means when he says, seek. We need to have an accurate understanding 
understanding of what it means to knock. And so that's what I want to do at this point in time. Because if if what we need to understand, what's so important is that our English Bibles that we study from, our English Bibles, these Bibles were translated into English. If it's the Old Testament, it was translated from Hebrew. If it's the, and, and actually there's uh, um, two layers from the Old Testament. In many cases, it's translated from Hebrew to the Septuagint into English. All right. And the New Testament is translated from Greek. And so if I'm going to, you know, because translations are not always precise, if I'm going to get an accurate understanding, sometimes it behooves me to go back to the original text. And so in this case, we want to go back to the original Greek and find out, well, what does he mean by Asif? I'm, I think I'm asking, and I think I'm seeking, and, and I think I'm finding. So let me go see what that, what the scripture that's translated as, you know, what that means. And the ones that translated see what that means. And the words that's translated as what, uh, are, are not what that means so that I can make sure that I'm responding and, have, and that I have an accurate understanding so that I can do and function in, re- in, in response accurately to get results. And so when we look at ask, and we, this, you know, we, we looked at this last week, it comes from the Greek word ayateo. And that word is translated ask, but it's also translated desire. But, as we, but then it's also translated require. So, you know, we're not require something. That's, that's not coy. Okay, see, ask, to me, that sounds like, it sounds coy. It sounds like, you know, uh, would you such and such, and if you say okay, okay, but if you don't say okay, I guess you don't say okay. You know, ask sounds, it, it, it has a coy uh, or, a, uh, you know, a, a, uh, a, a, a tint of coyness behind it. It doesn't have any passion. It doesn't have any uh, a, a fervency behind it. It doesn't necessarily have a, 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 a sense of, of, of determination uh, behind it. Uh, but when we go into this word ayatel, we see that this word means require. And now when I, when I require something, you know, there, you know that, that means I'm not taking no for an answer. See, when I ask something, I can take no for an answer. If you say no, then for the most part, I'm done. We're done with it. You said no, it's not going to happen, and it's over. Let it go. But when I require something, I'm not letting it go. When I require something, I'm not accepting no for an answer. And so when I see that this word, this, this word ask, this word ayateo from the Greek, it also means require, that gives me an understanding. Okay, well, sometimes in those prayers that I asked, I wasn't requiring it. Trans, you know, the word, the, a, a better translation in this, in this instance is to require it or to crave or to call for and then to ask for with expectation. See that? So there have been times when I look back over some of the prayer requests that I've made and I've asked, it says, ask and it will be given you. Everyone who asks, you know, to everyone who asks, they receive it. Well, when I think about that and some of the prayer requests that I've made where I didn't receive, I also recognize now that I didn't require it. I also recognize now that I didn't crave it. I didn't ask for it with an expectation. And so now with this more accurate understanding of what he's telling me to do there, now when I make my petition, I I take on a different posture. I take on a different stance. And as a result of a different posture, a different stance, I get different results. Now, the, uh, the next one is seek. Uh, the, the next word in that thing, you know, he says, ask and it will be given you, seek and you will find. And when I, when we go into the Greek word that's translated seek, that word is the tail, and it means to seek in order to find. All right. In other words, I, the purpose of my seeking is because I'm looking for something and I'm determined to find it. So it suggests a, 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 a passionate a uh, 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 posture in that regard to seek in order 
to find. I'm not I'm I'm not giving up on something. It's something that I'm determined. It it suggests a determination. That word also means to seek uh, or, or in other words to require or demand. Now notice that has common uh, that's common with, with the word that's translated as. But it's 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 talking about a, a tenacity here. It's talking about a an attitude and a posture that I'm not going to give up or back down or let it go. It's talking about a posture I'm not being denied. This word seek, the tail, also means to crave or to demand something from someone. So when I look back over the circumstances, you know, I, I prayed prayers and, you know, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. And I think about situations where I thought and I didn't find, you know, the reality is, I did not seek in order to find. I thought, but I wasn't seeking in order to find. Whereas this word is telling me I need to be seeking in order to find. In other words, there's a, de there's a determination there if, to require or demand. I might have been seeking, but I wasn't really requiring it. I, you know, I kind of looked around for it. I couldn't find it, so I was done with it. But there's a different posture that's taken when I'm requiring it or when I'm demanding it. And then to crave or demand something uh, to go, to come from to demand something from someone. And then finally, that word "not" that that Greek word that's translated "not" uh, chrono that you know that means to knock at the door, which is suggesting to rap at the door. It's like you're you're rapping at a door, and you're not going to go away until you get what it is that you came for. All right. So so when I look back over prayer requests in my past, where I may not have gotten the response. I, you know, I have to recognize I didn't do what he was describing here because I, my understanding was not accurate. I was, you know, reading the wrong translations. I was following the, the new international version or something like that. And any, uh, any, or listening to, you know, somebody who's preaching it and they're just talking, but they're not getting into what the Bible actually means and what, you know, the, 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 the original intent of the scripture uh, happened to have been. All right. So, uh, uh um, you know, that changes my posture. That changes my perspective. When I have, when I go back to the Greek in this sense, it changes my posture. It changes my perspective. It lets me know that there's it's a little bit more to this than meets the eye. And so let's turn now to the study, you know, where we started out talking about the uh, 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 various elements, things that we can look for when we're talking about ineffective prayer. And we talked about how, you know, I like to uh, analogize in effective prayer to prayer that misses the target. You know, if you, you we want our prayers to be targeted. We want to hit the target uh, with respect to our prayers. And so when we talk about in effective prayer, this is prayer that misses the target. And we, we looked at uh, letter A, which, which was prayer with doubt. If I'm praying with doubt or unbelief or double-mindedness or distrust in my heart, you know, those... You know, that would suggest that I'm uh, 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 not going to get my prayer answered. It's going to be ineffective prayer. All right. It's going to, that's going to be ineffective prayer, which will not be answered. He's not promising to answer prayer. Uh, if I've got doubt in my heart, he wants me to be in faith. He's not promising to answer prayers if I don't believe or if I'm double-minded or if I don't trust him. And our scripture reference, which is found on page two of our handout, comes from James, that first chapter, verses five through eight. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. See what he says there? It's important, it's necessary, he says, that we ask in faith. He says, let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. See that there? Doubt is an enemy to our faith. He says it's needful and necessary for us to ask in faith with no doubting. He goes on to say, uh, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven tossed by the wind, okay, like a wave of a sea, driven, tossed by wind. You ever seen a boat out on the sea and its anchor is not down, you know, as the waves are coming and going, that boat is just being tossed around. And he's saying that's the analogy that he's drawing to the person uh, who, who's uh, uh, praying and they're doubting. So he says, let them ask and think with no doubting. And then he goes on to say in verse 7, 
Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. See that right there? He says, if I'm going to be doubting, if I'm going to be wavering, if I'm going to be double-minded in my prayer, if I don't believe God, if I, you know, if I distrust God, I don't really know that God's going to do this for me. He says, don't expect to receive anything from the Lord if that's, if that's where I'm at. Without, you know, you know, we're not, you know, without raising your hand, some of us can confess. There are times that we have doubted. There are times that we have prayed. Uh, I'm with unbelief. There have been times that we have prayed and we've been wavering, sometimes up, sometimes down. We believe today, we don't believe tomorrow, we believe this morning, tonight we don't know where we are. And and, and we and Jesus says that we're just like the wave, you know, uh, a boat that's being tossed around by the waves of the sea. He says in verse 7, let not that man, let not that person suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Wow. So then doubt so then uh, un- unbelief, double-mindedness, distrust, those things are enemies to us getting our prayer answered. They cause our prayers to be ineffective. He says in verse 8, the reason is that person is double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Let not that man, verse 7 says, suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Why? He is double-minded. He is unstable in all his ways. God wants his people to be anchored in our trust in him. We need to be rooted. We can't be believers in today and we're unbelievers tomorrow. We're, you know, we're strong Christians today and tomorrow we're backsliding and up and down and in and out. God said, he, when he said, get hot or get cold. Amen. He will get hot or get cold. It's time out for all this flickering back and forth. And, and, and he has, he, we see here that God has little patience for that. He says, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. So what that tells me when I analyze my prayers and when I look back over my prayers and I, you know, try to figure out what happened here, did I fall short there and so on and so forth, I have to look at, was I doubting? Was I wavering? Uh, was I double-minded? Uh, uh, did I believe? Did I trust God or did I not trust God? And if I am honest and I can see, well, yeah, I did doubt. Yes, I, I know I wasn't believing. Yes, I was double-minded. Yes, I didn't trust God in there. Then that would be an explanation as to why the prayer was ineffective. That would be an explanation as to why it missed the target. Let's look over at Mark 11, chapter verse 22 through 24, which is the scripture that we added. It wasn't in the original. So if you downloaded the copy of the study notes from tonight for a couple of weeks ago, there are going to be some uh, modifications. We've done some editing. We've added some things that were not in the original uh, handout. So you might want to go out, go back online and get an updated copy. All right. So when we mark the 11th chapter, verses 22 through 24, the scripture says, Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. We talked about this last week. This is when he cursed the fig tree. And they came back the next day and found that the fig tree had withered away. Jesus said, have faith in God. The better translation is have faith, have the faith of God or have the same kind of faith that God has. Do it this way, in other words. He says, for surely I say to you, whoever, King James says, whosoever, I love the King James in that, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. See that there? Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. But here's the condition. Here's the big part right here. Does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done. King James Version says, believe that those things which he says shall come to pass. Jesus says, he will have whatever he says. See what he's saying here? Uh, but but what is the, what's the condition here? What's the qualifier here? He says, does not doubt in his heart. Now, he's talking about a literal mountain there. Uh, if, if I go up to, if any of us go up to a literal mountain, Jesus means what he says. He's not lying. He's not pulling our leg. He's not trying to give us a, a, an analogy. He's speaking what he wants us to understand as truth and how faith works. He said, this is how God's faith works, and you can exercise that same type of faith because it's available to us. But the conditions are, 
that when we uh, say to the mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, he says, we cannot doubt in our hearts when we do that. And we've got to believe that whatever it is that we're saying will come to pass. See those conditions? Can't doubt in your heart? Must believe that what you say will be done. When we meet those requirements, the scripture says we will have what we say. So then when I look back over my uh, prayers and some prayers uh, that I may have been frustrated by because I'm wondering, you know, why didn't I, why I pray for this and it didn't come to pass, it didn't work and so on and so forth. I have to, when I look at this, you know, this question is asked, the question that comes to mind is this. Did I doubt in my heart? Did I doubt in my heart? That's the question. Did I doubt in my heart? Look at the second part of this question. Did I believe that whatever I was saying would be done? I got to believe what I say. And so that tells me I need to say what I want. See, this is the other part of that. We spend a lot of time talking about stuff that's contrary to what we want, contrary to what we desire, contrary to the word of God. And that's interfering with our prayers being heard. Because what we need to say is not, oh, I'm in so much pain today. Oh, I'm having so many problems today. Oh, all of this stuff is going bad and going wrong today. That's not what we need to say. That should not be our conversation. Our conversation needs to be, be in line with what God promised us. Because he says we have to believe that what we say will be done. So if what I'm saying is that I'm having all these problems, if what I'm saying is I'm in all this pain, that's what's coming to pass because I'm having what I say. So instead of saying my back went out or my back is bothering me or my legs are bothering me and pray for me, oh, Arthur, and the doctor just gave me the whole book report about cancer, instead of letting that be my conversation, I need to cut that conversation short and instead say by his stripes, I'm healed. And if I believe that by his stripes I'm healed, Jesus said, I will have what I say. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All right. So when we talk about prayers with that Mr. Target or prayers that are ineffective, when there's prayer that involves doubt, unbelief, double-mindedness, distrust, those prayers will miss the target and be ineffective. Then we look at letter B, which is when we pray with mess or strife or unforgiveness in our heart. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm involved in all this mess. You know, I'm, I'm involved in all this confusion. I'm bickering and fighting with you. I'm bickering and fighting with the next one. I'm rolling my eyes at this one. I'm not speaking to that one over there. Well, then, see, that's mess. That's strife. You know, I'm, I'm not forgiving that person because they did something to me to, that to me was, is unforgivable, and I'll never forgive them. And it occurred 25 years ago, but I'll never forgive them. Well, see, that's going to interfere with my prayer. Because that type of conduct will cause my prayers to be ineffective. It will cause my prayers to miss the target, to miss the mark. Let's look over James 4 uh, and 2. James 4 and 2 says, You lust, you do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And then let's look over at Mark 11, uh, verses 25 and 26. Jesus says here, Whatever you, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Verse 26 says, if you do not forgive that person, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. So if I'm walking in unforgiveness, if I'm walking in mess, if I'm in strife, all those types of things, that will interfere with my prayer and cause it to be ineffective. So when I look over my life and I say, okay, I was praying for God to do such and such, and I was praying and praying and praying, and I went on a fast, and I was standing on his word, and I was doing all these things, and so on and so forth, and, and I don't understand what happened. Well, w one question I need to ask myself is, was I bickering with somebody was if i wasn't speaking to someone so you know i i i was walking in unforgiveness those types of things can hinder the scripture says my prayer cause them to be ineffective cause them to miss 
the target. All right, let's look at letter C. Letter C, when we talk about ineffective prayer, which is prayer that misses the target, letter C consists of prayer when you pray self-serving prayers, self-serving prayers that are contrary to the will of God. Over in James, when we look at our notes, over in James, that fourth chapter, in verse 3, he says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. You ask amiss. You're asking, you know, self-serving prayers. You're asking, you know, prayers that are contrary to the will of God, uh, uh, contrary to the word of God, because it's something that you just want for yourself. That's your flesh. And so you're praying in your flesh, and so that's not getting a response. Why? Because it's in your flesh that you may consume it on your pleasures. You don't care anything about the will of God. You don't care anything about the, the word of God. You don't care anything about glorifying God. For you, it's just all about you. And so that prayer is, that's praying amiss. And, you know, it's because it's all about you. That you may spend it, consume it on your own self, on your own pleasure, without any regard to God, without any regard to the will of God, without any regard to what's going to bring glory to God. Well, when that's done, it's prayer that's ineffective, prayer that will miss the target. All right? Now, let's look at letter D. Letter D is when the person prays with condemnation in his or her heart. The prayers that are prayed with condemnation in his or her heart. Pastor, what you mean by condemnation? When I, the root word is condemned, I don't feel worthy. I don't feel entitled. I'm such a, I'm such, I was such a horrible person. When I was in the world, I was such a horrible person. You know, I'm just glad to be saved. I'm so grateful that God didn't cut me off. And so I'm not looking for him to do anything particular for me. Just take me on home and let me go home to be with him and I'll be satisfied. Okay, because, you know, based upon, you know, my past, uh, how I can, you know, how I live my life or where I grew up or how I grew up. Oh, the family that I went through, uh, you know, the things that I uh, were, you know, that happened to me when I was young, you know, caused me to feel unworthy. And that sense of unworthiness, that sense of condemnation will interfere with your ability to receive from God, to, to get your prayers through. Because the bottom line is this, you know, this one actually is practical. If I don't feel worthy, then I'm not going to be able to pray a prayer of faith because I don't feel worthy. If I don't feel entitled, if I don't feel, you know, that God, you know, that I deserve for God to do this. And of course, now when I say deserve, I'm using that term loosely because none of us deserve anything. All right. But God has put us in a position where he said it is for us. And so we deserve it because he said it, not based upon our own merit. Okay, so when I say deserve, I'm not talking about deserve on account of my merit. I'm talking about deserve on account of God saying that it's mine.